Greetings from Sefer Publishing Group, and welcome to another edition of Sefer Moments. I'm Dr. Stephen Pigeon. Today we're going to continue our discussion about this issue of the brass, which in the Hebrew is nekoshet, and the serpents, which in the Hebrew is nachoshim, nachoshim. But that's not really where I'm going to begin my discussion today. I'm going to begin my discussion talking about some Greek as soon as I turn my phone off for a moment here. And when we talk about the Greek, this is going to become pretty important because we're going to be talking about this image. And the image is called the Caduceus. The Caduceus. Now the Caduceus, many people have seen this, Caduceus. And in my opinion, it, it has become a hidden image, but nonetheless a hidden image that is worshipped by many, many people in our culture today. They may not know they worship it, but they do. Now the caduceus is two serpents wrapped around a pole with a set of wings on top. Okay? It was allegedly a staff carried by Hermes in Greek mythology, and it became uh, the Hermes Tres Magistus in Greco-Egyptian mythology. And it is the symbol of what? Healing and medicine. Now, it's very important here that we see that this symbol, this caduceus, is not a serpent, but two serpents wrapped around a pole, okay? Two serpents wrapped around a pole. Now, in the Hebrew, this word for serpents is Nachashim, Nachashim, and it's interestingly enough, it's spelled Nun, Het, Shin, and then of course Yod, Mem, Safit for the plural. But the root is Nachash, which means serpent, Nachash, Nun, uh, it's uh, Nun, Shin, uh, uh, Nun, Het, Shin, okay, Nachash. Now, Moses, of course, was told to put he was supposed to put, uh, you know, the, the phrase, the actual passage reads in in Numbers 21, 8. And Iyawa said unto Moshe, make a saraf and set it upon a flag. That is, make an image of a saraf and put it on a banner. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looks upon it, shall live. Now, you can say, shall live. But it also means to look upon it and see life, okay? Look upon this image of the seraph and see life. But when you get to the Midbar 21.9, we find this. And Moshe made a serpent of brass. That is to say, the word there for brass, Nechoshet. Nechoshet. And he put in on a pole. He didn't put the seraph on the banner, no. He made a serpent of brass. He made a nachash nechoshet and he put that on a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent bit any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. If he was bitten by a serpent, then he could look on this serpent of brass and live. Now this serpent of brass, a brazen serpent, it would be called, was later called the Nahushtan, the Nahushtan. This was an image, this brazen serpent on a pole that Moshe had built, became an image that was among the house of Yasharel for years and years and years. And in fact, it was destroyed by Yekiskaiahu, or Hezekiah, uh, during his uh, tenure as king over the house of Yahud, or Judea. So you had King Hezekiah, whose prophet, of course, the prophet living at that time was Yeshayahu, or Isaiah. Isaiah was advising Hezekiah, and Hezekiah struck down the high places, and he destroyed the Nahushtan, this brazen serpent that had been created by Moshe, because people were worshipping it. Now, let's raise to the issue of medicine modern-day medicine. Now, what does the average believer believe in this country? Does the average believer worship these two serpents on a pole? 
And I submit to you that they do, in fact, worship that very thing. We have this assumption in society that somehow everyone has a fundamental human right to health care, right? And remember that this image that was set up, this symbol of this caduceus that was set up by, uh, by the Greeks, a symbol of Hermes, that is supposed to symbolize healing and medicine, right? is the symbol you see over so many of the things we see under the American Medical Association, Association, the Hippocratic Oath, Hippocratic Oath, the Hippocratic Oath, Hippocrates, not hypocrites, the Hippocratic Oath, and so on and so forth. And what you see is this symbol is given, the symbol of healing and medicine, which is what? Nachashim, two serpents, two serpents, Nachashim. All right, but the word for brass, nekoshet, Assuming, of course, that the E is the proper vowel sound and the O is the proper vowel sound in a word that is spelled Nun, Chet, Shin, Tav. Okay? That's a big assumption. Because actually what we have here is we have Nachash, singular, which is Nun, Chet, Shin, Nachash, serpent. And then we have Nachashim, Nun, Chet, Shin, Yod, Mem, Sapit, the masculine plural, and then we have Nachashot, which is Nun, Chet, Shin, Tav, Nachashot, a feminine plural. In other words, we have the masculine plural, Nachashim, male serpents, I guess, and then we have Nachashot, the feminine plural which is the word that is conveniently used for brass because Moshe elected to put the serpent on a pole in brass. Nekoshet. Okay? So, we have people worshipping the Nachashot, the serpents, and they are worshipping it. I have a right to health care. I have a right to healing. I have a right to medicine. All right, now we need to explore this a little bit, especially against the fundamental uh, uh, mitzvot, the, the fundamental mitzvah, the fundamental chok that is found in the Ten Commandments, which is thou shalt not steal. Okay, this is a fundamental chok, commandment. All right, now in this commandment, it says thou shalt not steal. You shall not steal anything that belongs to your neighbor. Well, what about your neighbor's labor. What about your neighbor's life energy? What about your neighbor's expertise? Is it okay to steal that? I mean, that's a question. Well, I have a fundamental right to health care. Okay, you have a fundamental right to health care, which means what? You have a fundamental right to seek the health care? Or do you have a fundamental right to receive the health care? In other words, if I get sick, do I have a right to go to the hospital and receive free treatment? If I get sick, do I have the right to free prescription drugs? If I get sick, do I have the right to a free diagnosis? If I get sick with a terminal disease, do I have a right to nonstop health care to contribute uh, to continue to try to keep me alive for the next 30 years? I mean, these are questions, right? And. I believe that most Americans have been convinced because there is no fundamental right in the U.S. Constitution to, to protect you from idolatry. In other words, the Ten Commandments says, thou shalt not worship any graven image, right? You shall not worship any graven image, wherever it may be. There is no, having no other things of worship before the eternal creator, Yahweh. You are to have nothing in front of him. You are to worship nothing in front of him. There is to be no idolatry, no bowing down, and worshiping created things, images. Okay. We know that this is an edict. And, and this is, uh, again, it's a hook from the Ten Commandments. And again, you see also that we have thou shalt not steal in that same roster. Okay. Now, with that kept in mind, now we turn around and say, well, I have a fundamental right to healing and medicine. Now, this is the difficulty with saying I have a fundamental right to this healing and medicine. Number one, why is this healing and medicine so critically important to the believer? Isn't the believer required to trust in the hand of Yah in terms of your provision? 
isn't it true that if you lived in accord with scripture that is to say you ate the things that were called food and didn't eat the things that were not called food that you didn't engage in the pollution of the temple right which is the body that you didn't engage in the pollution of the temple then you could rely on the healing and the protection of the hand of the Ruach HaKodesh as the breath of Yah encompasses the earth. And remember that we are tied immediately via our Nefesh to the Ruach HaKodesh. Okay? Our Nefesh is here, but it is giving us information to the flesh. There are three and a half trillion cells in the human body. Each cell gives off a bite of information each second. That's three and a half trillion bytes of information coming off the body, going to the nephesh, the nephesh in turn transmitting that same amount of uh, signal back into the body. And remember that every cell in the body is replaced every seven years. You're a new creation every seven years. So what is different? Well, you have information being fed into the DNA predicated and premised upon Yah's determination for the life of the species on this planet. It is his determination, not our determination, his control, not our control. And so when we say to ourselves, well, gee, we want to rely on healing and medicine as expressed in the Nachashim, in the two serpents. We want to rely on the healing as expressed in the two serpents rather than to rely on the healing that is handed to us by the Ruach HaKodesh rather than relying on the instruction, the Torah, that is given to us by Yahweh, following that Torah and trusting in Him, no, we're going to trust in the two serpents. And remember that Yahweh has given us so many naturopathic remedies and also the preventive medicine is also found in naturopathy. That is to say, there are so many natural remedies that allow you to continue a course of health by not ingesting synthetics. Now we know that in the healthcare world today, we have many, many people all over the country that are dying from opioid abuse. Now this is prescription opioid abuse, not over-the-counter stuff or stuff that you're buying on the street corner, we're talking about over-the-counter, or, or excuse me, prescription opioid substances that have been created for us and approved by our healthcare gurus. That is to say, the managers of the Nachashim, the ones who keep the two snakes in the basket and then play the little you know, flute to get the heads to come up, called the FDA. They are managing these serpents and these ser managers of the serpents have determined that derivatives of the opium crop that is being harvested in Afghanistan and other places in the world that create opioid-based drugs are legal. And they can be dispensed and they can be prescribed for various uh, anomalies and various afflictions that a, a human being might have in this country. And many people who know of the power of oxycodone or oxycodone will tell you it only takes a couple and then you're finding yourself desiring them, like an addiction, like a junkie wants heroin. Uh, you're you're de desiring those opioids in the same way. And so we know that there are many, many deaths that are happening across the country as a result of opioid addiction and opioid abuse. I'm not blaming the medical profession, I'm just saying that that's what the condition in the country is. Where I am laying the blame is on the worship of the two serpents, right? The Nachashim, the Nachashim, the worshiping of the two serpents. I have to have medical care. Now let's talk about free medical care for a moment. I want free medical care. Okay, well what does that mean? Well, I want to be able to go to the doctor if I have a critical condition. Well, come to think of it, I want to be able to go to the doctor if I have a non-critical condition. In fact, now that you mention it, I want to be able to go to the doctor if I have a sniffle, if I picked up a flu bug, a 24-hour flu bug, if I get a, a little anomaly with this, a little anomaly with that, if I'm just a, a hypochondriac, I want to be able to go to the doctor and I want to be able to get a full panoply of services. I want the MRI, I want the ultrasound, I want this, I want that, I want, you know, 
you exhaust every remedy until I am satisfied that all I have is the common cold. So it's possible for a person to demand medical care every single day. Every single day. And it's possible for the lazy to say, I don't want to have to take my time to make an appointment with my preferred provider. I want to be able to go to the ER or I want to be able to go to an open clinic and I want to be able to walk in the door and demand services and I don't want to have to wait for it and I want to be able to get the entirety of what's available in the medical profession to be exhausted on me and my claim daily. So you see that what happens is when you begin to worship the Nachashim that you reach that place that is common to the flesh which is what? The flesh always desires more, right? A guy who's worth $100,000, well, he wants to be a millionaire. A guy who's a millionaire, he wants to be a multimillionaire. The multimillionaire wants to be a billionaire. The billionaire wants to be a multibillionaire, and the multibillionaire wants to be the first to hit a trillion. And it never ends. Gee, I've got a $30 million jet, but I'm praying now for a $70 million jet because my $30 million jet is not fast enough, it's not cool enough, and it doesn't have quite the range to reach that one city I'm never going to go to anyway. Right? Because the flesh always wants more. I don't have enough. I'm not satisfied. I'm not getting what I my objective. It's the same thing with worshiping the Nachashim. You want medical care and you want more and more and more of it. So what's the first thing you see in a socialized, single-payer medical, medical system? You see rationing. It's the very first thing you see. Rationing. Well, look, we're going to give free health care to everybody, everybody but, but there are limits to what we're going to give you. Now, some of these limits in some health care systems are just outrageous. For instance, the Oregon uh, socialized health care system for many years did not allow for a treatment for breast cancer for women over 55. If you get breast cancer and you're on Oregon health care, die. You know, we will allow for euthanasia. Here's two, you know, here's two cyanide pills. Take two, drop dead, don't call me in the morning. Right? Because we have to ration health care. Now, in addition to that, once we begin rationing, well, we don't want any health care for people who were born with a deformity. Why should they get health care? That's inordinate. We don't want health care for the disabled. We don't want health care for the sick or the elderly. Well, people scream, well, look, all of us are a little bit sick. You can't deny health care for a pre-existing condition. Okay, we'll allow a pre-existing condition on one condition that your claim for medical malpractice goes away. There is no medical malpractice from here on out. You live with what you get. So, for instance, in Canada, when the Canadian healthcare system, single-payer socialized medicine, decided to buy blood from the prison system out of Arkansas that was supervised by, at that time, Governor Bill Clinton. And they hadn't supervised that blood very clearly, so they got all this blood in Canada that was tainted with AIDS virus. And as a result, 30,000 Canadians became ill, many of them died. And because it was a socialized health care system, the Canadian government said, well, look, here's your remedy. We're giving each family 3000 bucks, and now shut up. Because there is no malpractice under that system, so you just stuck with whatever you get. Now, in addition to that, that rationing then is going to curtail, we're not going to give this procedure, we're not going to give that procedure, but we will give, you know, transsexual surgery, that's going to be funded. Late-term abortion, that's going to be funded. But breast cancer treatment after 55, no. Uh, you know, heart condition treatment after 65, no. Cancer treatment after 65, no. If you come down with those things, drop dead. Your life is valueless to our society. Because why? Not because you don't bring wisdom to the table. Not because, you, you, you know, you're, you're not a patriarch of the family or a matriarch of the family. No, rather, you're not a taxpayer. You see, you're not paying tax to our system. We don't have any health care for you. Drop dead. Now, in addition to that, once you have a single-payer health care system, again, worshiping this Nachashim, you see that everybody and their brother has an interest in your life, lifestyle, right? Well, wait a minute. We need to stop smoking. If we're going to have to pay for everybody's cancer treatment and everybody's emphysema treatment, then we need to get people to stop smoking because we don't want to pay for that treatment. Okay, so now so smoking is now banned. 
Well, while we're at it, we don't want to pay for everybody's liver treatment and their pancreas treatment, so let's stop the drinking too. Yeah, that's a good idea. And then given the fact that we have obesity as an epidemic in the United States, we need to ration services to those people who are willfully obese, right? Again, a phrase that can easily be introduced in a nakashim medical system. Yeah, the willfully obese, you know, those people who have inflicted morbid obesity upon themselves are not deserving of any treatment. They're not deserving of any socialized treatment. If they want to get health care, fly to Mexico and get it because you're not going to get it here. Right? Now, this turns out to be a, a real issue because, of course, in a single payer system, you and your brother have an interest in the lifestyle of someone else. Okay? And as that worship, that worshiping of the serpent becomes more and more intense, the demands of the serpent also become more and more intense. And so eventually you find yourself in a situation where you have an intense social fascism, a social totalitarianism. You can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this. And if, if it was a scientific uh, totalitarianism that actually looked at the data, what would they find? Well, they'd find out that stuff like, you know, uh, the, the foods that are in fact filters that just filter nothing but toxins, such as pork, such as shrimp, such as crab, are not going to be edible anymore. But rather than you following voluntarily under the easy yoke and the like burden of Mashiach who said, these are foods that are proper to eat and these foods are improper. No, rather, you'd rather have, you'd rather be worshiping the serpents and have someone who is managing the serpents telling you by force, you do not get to eat those ever. Right? And so this is what happens with the worshiping of the Nachashim. However, when we talk about Moses putting the serpent on the pole, and we have this term here, Nachash Nechoshet, Nachash Nechoshet, right? Serpent of brass. Okay, that's very interesting because we have a feminine plural now, a feminine plural that shows up rather than the masculine plural of serpents, Nachashim, now we have the feminine plural, Nachashot. This becomes an interesting issue because we're going to see this. I'm going to use one other word to compare this while we're talking about this discussion. And I know this video is getting long, but I want to talk about it anyway. You know, we have at the Sefer Publishing Group, we use the word Sefer, book, right? Which in one, uh, in one formulation, actually it doesn't mean book, although in the modern Hebrew it does mean book. But in the ancient Hebrew it meant scroll. Not book, but scroll. Sefer, scroll. And if you had many scrolls and you had sefrim or sefarim, sefrim, you had many scrolls, right? That was the plural, the masculine plural of the term sefer. But there's another term, sefer, which means to count, right? Because really, the sefer is not just a scroll, but it's a scroll that is a scroll of counting. That is to say, counting verses or a numbered scroll. Uh, you know, books, chapters, verses. The, the verses are numbered, the books are numbered. Yeah, so it's a numbered scroll, a numbered scroll. Okay, so sefer, you know, means to count. And you have this plural. So we have this plural of sefer, sefrim, the masculine plural, which talks about many scrolls. But there is the word sefer and its plural, sefarot. Now sefarot is an interesting term because sefarot, if you look sefarot up right now, you're going to find, of course, what they call the Etz Chaim, that is to say a, uh, a two-dimensional depiction of the 10 radiances and the 22 paths connecting them, right? Which is called the Sephirot. Now, this Sephirot has, of course, been adopted by Hindu theology and a number of other theologies, New Age theologies, to predict chakras and so on and so forth which, by the way, is outside the scope of, of scriptural teaching. However, when you talk about these 22 paths, what do you talk, why do they call it the Sephirot? Because it is the countings, okay? It's the countings. We're counting the 22 paths of the Aleph Bayit in those 22 paths uh, as they connect between the 10 radiances that are the expression of the image of Iyawa, okay? However, 
As soon as we move into this provision of Seferot, you see how we have, instantly we have a tainting of occultism. We have a tainting of mysticism. We have a tainting of supernaturalism. Well, it's the same thing with this term, Nachash and Nachash, uh, Nachashot. Nachashot, this feminine plural, the, the, the hint here is that there is a supernatural aspect. That is to say, by looking upon the two snakes wrapped around the pole, somehow you're going to obtain healing, somehow you're going to obtain medicine, right? It's a supernatural belief in what? The serpents, Nachashot. Not Nachashim, but Nachashot. A, sur a supernatural believing in the serpent's ability to heal. And this is what the condition was with Moshe's serpent on a pole, his brazen serpent on a pole, or serpent of brass on the pole, the Nachash Nekoshet on the pole, this nekoshet implies in the brass that there is an occult. There's nachashot in the nekoshet, okay? There are serpents with supernatural capability inside the brass, okay? This can be found from looking at the exegesis of the Hebrew using a pardes, pesha, remez, darash, sod, in particular looking at the sod analysis of these words and comparing them and to see what is here, right? To see what is here. And so when you're talking about, let's take a look for a moment at this at this tedusha of this word nachash, right? Nachash, you know, this this uh, nun chet shin, right? Uh, you know, uh, this, this destruction of the seed, right? The destruction of the seed. And so, you know, this becomes extremely important in terms of understanding where these words are going and what this is. And so we talk about this idolatry. And it is idolatry. It is idolatry to worship the Caduceus or the Caduceus, okay? It's idolatry to worship the Caduceus. It's idolatry to expect that the two serpents and the practitioners of the faith of the Nachashim, or the Nachashot, the practitioners of the faith of the Nachashot or Nachashim, that they are going to give you healing and medicine that Iyawa has not already provided for you in this life. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna leave it at this. Let us consider that when, again when we look at this idea of the Hebrew and we look at this idea of the serpent. So I want to thank you for being with me today and I hope to see you again. Blessings from Sefer Publishing Group.